guys this evening to talk about media diversity and firmly cement the target that may be on my back already from certain organisations. I firmly believe that the increasing lack of diversity in Australian media is dangerous. We'll never see troublous, troublesomely honest journalists jailed for criticising the government, and nor are they likely to start disappearing. But the media oligarchy we have, and that is what it is in my opinion, are detrimental to our democracy. Are we on a slippery slope? Is the lack of media diversity something about which we should be concerned? Is freedom of the press worth a fight? Is it valuable enough for us to care? 20th century American journalist A.J. Liebling once said, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own the press. Here, literally referring to a printing press, in other words, those who produce the news in whatever form control it. The guy who owns the newspaper company is the only guy who has true freedom of the press. So before I get into the weeds of media diversity in Australia and explain how we can do better and why we should do better, here are three more quotes about freedom of the press. Gandhi said, freedom of the press is a precious privilege that no country can forego. Walter Cronkite said, freedom of the press is not just important for democracy, it is democracy. And lastly, the Prime Minister of Australia, who said on Sky News in 2019, media freedom is incredibly important to who we are and protecting the integrity of its diversity is exactly what we're doing. I think I'm going to challenge the last part of that statement. What is the state of play in Australia? In answering that question, I'm going to make comparisons between Australia and the Nordic states. Remember those countries, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Sweden and Finland, have a combined population of about 27 million, so roughly the same as us. The 2020 Press Freedom Index ranked Australia 26 in the world, which was a drop of five places from the 2019 report. Who holds the top four? You guessed it, the Nords. Australia is the only Western country in which the leading press company accounts for more than half of daily newspaper circulation. The top four media companies, News Corp, Nine, formerly Fairfax, Seven West and APN have 99% of circulation share. Nine and News Corp have tried a number of times to tighten this control further by attempting to force a closure of Australia's only newswire service, the AAP. The ACCC reports that 106 local and regional newspapers closed between 2008 and 2018, effectively meaning that 21 local government areas no longer have any local news coverage. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation places Australia 13th out of 18 Western countries for per capita funding of public broadcasters, of which Australia only has three, the ABC, SBS and NITV. The largest of these, the ABC, has had its funding halved since 87. Yes, that's half. The ABC costs Australia four cents a day in 87, it now costs us eight. Those numbers represent a dramatic decline in real funding. Finland spends twice as much on its public broadcasters, while Norway spends three times as much. Scott Morrison says everything's been done to protect media diversity, so is it really? Clearly very little has been done to support our most trusted national broadcaster. Between them, they provide eight free-to-air channels and 15 radio stations. In the Nordic countries, there's 19 public TV channels and 19 radio stations with a number of population of 27 million. So they're leading the world in robust and free media. And how do they do it? I'll come to that later. There's an obvious ongoing and significant erosion of press freedom in Australia, which since the 70s, the moves to establish an Australian press council to function as a kind of ombudsman, Sweden has a media ombudsman, uh, since its inception and all subsequent recommendations for greater media accountability have been vehemently opposed by vested media interests. And speaking of vested interests, and as yet another example of a problem, the increasingly perceived right-wing bias by the Murdoch Home Press in Australia was a significant driver behind former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's 2020 petition calling for the establishment of a Royal Commission into media diversity. During its three-week life, gained more than half a million signatures the largest ever electronic submission presented to an Australian parliament. So here's a summary of what the inquiry found, and I quote from the report's description. Through the evidence presented to the inquiry, the committee found that the current regulatory environment from a news media is weak, fragmented and inconsistent. As a result, large media organisations have become so powerful and unchecked that they've developed corporate cultures that consider themselves beyond the existing accountability framework. I'll just read that again. Through the evidence presented to the inquiry, the committee has found that the current regulatory environment for news media is weak, fragmented and inconsistent. 
So the large media organisations are so powerful and unchecked, they now have corporate cultures considering themselves beyond the existing accountability framework. I find that disturbing. While national broadcasters continue to suffer a lack of support via severe funding cuts, ownership of media outlets by private companies is becoming more concentrated. So before looking at solutions, I want to stress that the current lack of media diversity in Australia has been exacerbated by a loss of revenue due to the challenge of digital media, which is dominated by tech giants. Before the advent of the internet, newspapers made most of their money from advertising. As online content providers have eaten into the readership of traditional print media, and in some cases even cannibalised each other, so too have advertising revenues fallen. For many providers, there's simply no longer enough money to pay for new services. So they've taken to installing paywalls and offering subscription-only services, but this is in itself a restriction, a barrier for those who either do not want to pay for something that used to be free, or for those who cannot pay access to journalistic product becomes increasingly restricted. The Nordic nations found a proactive and deliberate action to preserve and strengthen media diversity as a provision of political welfare. To this end, they enjoy strong financial and regu regulatory support from their governments, even in the face of declining readership of newspapers, for example. The political approach is pro-journalism and news. The governments are very much for media diversity, and we aren't simply talking about the kind of lip service given federally. The attitude is that quality journalism, diverse and independent, is good for the public, and the citizens of the Nordic states agree. Now, the citizens, and that's how they view themselves as citizens, not consumers, note the distinction. They want media diversity because they believe it is as important as defence, research and infrastructure. They're concerned with government accountability and competent public policy making. The question is why? Why is high quality, responsible, diverse and independent media important? And why is it seen as crucial to the health of a democratic state? Here's an interesting quote from Finley Peter Dunn, a journalist and humorist who was writing in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He said, the job of a newspaper, journalism, is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Quality, independent journalism is good for a democracy because it exposes corruption and contributes to both good governance and ethical decision-making. It's about accountability. Imagine the social cost of underinvestment in journalism. Well, you don't have to, because it's happening. It's about truth-telling, the provision of information and the stoking of the fires of public debate. The goals of investment in media diversity should be to, that we have increased media literacy, we have increased trust in the media, there's high quality journalism, increased diversity, a fully informed public and a healthy democracy. I'm saying that Australia underinvests under in media diversity and as a result, we have information and news controlled and fashioned for our consumption by a handful of vested interests who see themselves as being outside of acceptable boundaries of accountability. That's the problem in a nutshell. The answer to the problem is demonstrated so well by the Nordic states is money and legislation. And I'll ask permission to read a short quote from a book, The Nordic Edge. Regulation can be an instrument to counter the negative consequences of radical commercialisation processes, where the selection and presentation of the news are highly influenced by self-serving commercial considerations rather than journalistic and societal ones. In practical terms, what's been done to counter the problem? So they've introduced a range of subsidies to private broadcasters and news companies while public broadcasters are largely funded by licensing fees, in Australia, as you know, the public broadcasters receive direct government funding, being steadily eaten away by a succession of cost-cutting exercises. The general model for media subsidies in most of the Nordic states is based on the number of journalists employed, the diversity of readership, and the amount of democratically important political and cultural content they create. On the other hand, Australian government subsidies to media companies seem to be ad hoc and lack transparency or accountability. And I don't need to remind you of the results of that approach. I call on Australian policymakers to consider the introduction of systemic permanent subsidies based on this model to ensure we're populated with enough independent news opinions to facilitate and accommodate a diverse range of views. Freedom of the press is not just important for democracy, it is democracy. Thank you, Madam Speaker.